So now we're gonna see how we can use what we call isotap measurements um, to, and in particular oxygen, to reconstruct past climate. So bear with me, that concept is um, a bit difficult, but hopefully with the drawings and my explanations, you can understand it <coughs> a bit better, sorry. So you have um, you have on, on this planet in water, oxygen in uh, the water because Water is made of uh, two atoms, uh, of three atoms, one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen, uh, H2O. That's where it comes from. Those atoms of oxygen um, can have a different amount of, um, of neutrons in, in their core, meaning that we can make the difference between an atom of oxygen that's slightly heavier, that we call oxygen 18, and differ differentiate that make the difference with oxy oxygen 16 that is a slightly lighter version of the same atom i'm talking about that because we can measure pretty precisely the amount of oxygen 18 o18 or oxygen 16 o16 into each sample of uh, of into samples of water of air or even in the ice and there is a very interesting principle is that O18 is heavier than O16 and you will see that in the way it interacts with the environment. So let's say you're evaporating some water from the ocean to make a cloud. Because O16 is lighter than O18, you will preferentially grab O16 atoms from the ocean. So if you evaporate some water from the ocean, it will preferentially have some O16 than O18. You carry that, you push your cloud onto the land, it starts raining, and well, because O18 is heavier than O16, O18 is going to be the, the atom that's going to preferentially be removed by the precipitation. And what happens during cooler climates like glaciations is that you have less energy available to, to evaporate the, the water from the ocean. If you have less energy available, it basically means you can take less O18 atoms because they are heavier. And what you can do is measure, measure the ratio of how many uh, atoms of O18 do I have compared to O16 or the other way around. If your climate is warmer, it means you have more energy to evaporate, so you're going to take more O18 uh, than, than usual. And so we can measure that amount of isotopes in um, <clears throat> shallow ice cores. Um, so for example, snow that falls into the, in the summer contains more O18 than, for snow, than snow that falls into in the, in the winter. Why is that? because in summer you have more energy. You have more energy, you can evaporate, you can take more O18 from the ocean and O18 precipitates preferentially. So you're going to have more O18 in your snow during the, the summer. And for snow that's falling into the winter because you have less energy available, because it's colder, you're going to have more O16 into your in your sample. And you can kind of apply that logic to uh, time records. So now we are going to talk about what we call delta uh, O18. And uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a formula for that. So now the formula magically appeared on this slide. So what the delta O18 calculates is how much O18 do I have compared to my amount of O16. And that value, the delta that we calculate, uh, it's going to be mostly negative, but it can be less negative. So the value increases or it can be more negative. The value decreases. And what happens is, if you remember, when we have a warm system, a warm climate, it has more energy. So it can evaporate, can take more O18. And the snow that's going to fall in a warmer climate is going to have more O18. Therefore, the value of that delta O18 is going to be higher during warm periods of time. And inversely, it's going to be, it's going to be lower during cold periods of time because you don't have as much energy to take O18 
O18 from the ocean, and therefore your snow will have way more O16 than O18 in, in, in an ice age particular. So the important concept here is if the delta O18 is higher than usual, the climate is warmer than usual. If the O18 is lower, then the climate is colder. And we can do that over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we have different ice cores here, show that different places you have Dome C here in red, Vostok, that's a bit uh, up north compared to it. Um, Dome Fuji, that is, I think, Dome F. No, my, I, I'm not sure, maybe Dome F. And they kind of all show the same trends. They show that that is the, I think the Delta O18, I'm not, entirely sure but they do show the same variations in time meaning that what we are observing at those cores are something is something regional it's not it's not happening at only one place and we can also measure the carbon dioxide and and, and link that to temperatures so we discovered uh decades ago that the amount of carbon the concentration of co2 in the in the atmosphere um of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is directly correlated to the temperature of the atmosphere. Or, and that's what we see when we have an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature spike. And when we have a decrease of CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperatures cool down. And here we have a few values of, uh, of typical CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We talk about ppm that's a way to measure the amount of co2 particles in a given uh, volume of air and throughout the throughout the the history of the earth there were periods where the ppm would rise to 6 7000 and that, those were periods of the time where there were dinosaurs at that time the earth was really super warm and there was there were no ice caps on the earth, probably not that many glaciers. But nowadays, um, uh, since man ha man has been on the mankind has been on the surface of the planet, the CO two has been actually pretty low, oscillating between two three hundred ppm. But um, since we started the industrial re industrial revolution, and what we can what we can see is an increase, a spike in CO two in the last few decades or the last one or two centuries, um, which is showing us, which is an indicator that uh, CO two is largely due to human activity, and we are expecting it to to cause an increase of in temperatures around the planet. So if we Compare that CO2 level that we have today uh, compared to before. So you said, you see, I said like uh, 200, 300. I was actually almost a bit generous. During the during the ice ages, you can see just based on the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere when the ice ages were. You have one around like a bit more than 350,000 years ago. Um, another one here, 250. Another 150,000 years ago and the last 20,000 years, something or so. And whenever there was a deglaciation happening, like around those times, the CO2 would spike, but usually stay below 300 ppm. And when you have what you have here in modern history is a wall. It's spiking up, and it's spiking up uh, not only in terms of value of CO2 in the atmosphere, but also in terms of the amount of time in which during which it happened. Usually it would take a few... 100,000 years, but here it happens in, in just one or two centuries. So the CO2 during mankind's history uh, has never been higher than what it is now and never really higher than 300 ppm, but now we are way above that. Um, so basically in the last century alone, CO2 rose by the same amount that it would rise usually at the exit of the nice age. The issue is that it already had risen uh, from this amount before, in the few last thousand years. So what you have is basically the equivalent of coming out of two ice ages in, in just a few thousand years, which is, yeah, uh, kind of dramatic. Uh, Chris Prep about that, which atmospheric gas has been shown to best explain changes in the average temperature of Earth's uh, atmosphere? I'm going to give you a few seconds. So yeah, the answer here is carbon dioxide, CO2. Answer C. 
What is the current concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how does it compare to the past 500,000 years of ice core records? Give you a few seconds. And the answer here is a 415 more or less ppm, significantly higher than before. It is absolutely not answer D. No one knows for sure. We know about that. Uh, there is no skepticism to have about uh, if the planet is warming and, and the CO2 level in the atmosphere compared to a few thousand years, a few thousand, um, yeah, a few thousand years ago. The planet is warming. We are causing it and um, the CO2 levels are much higher than before, primar primarily due to our activity. So let's finish this lecture with a summary. Um, glaciers erode, uh, can erode and deposit sediments to form uh, different features, U-shaped valleys, fjords, moraines, erratics, and drumlin, and each of these features can provide some information on the glaciers. Ice cores contain a record of past climate and atmospheric condition dating back to 800,000 years before the present. And we saw also where we would uh, ideally take up, uh, drill an ice core to get the data and how we can date the ice thanks to uh, volcano ash layers, uh, volcanic ash layers, or, or also use the air trapped in the bubbles um, sorry, the bubbles of air trapped in the ice to, to reconstruct the atmosphere. And yeah, all those measurements are, are giving us direct precious information about prehistoric atmosphere uh, and how the, the, the climate that we are modifying right now uh, with our activity is due to us and not due to some kind of, uh, not due to really anything else. So yeah. Um, like change is real for those who had a doubt still, but hopefully that's not the case for anybody in that class. Okay, uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, next one will be the last lecture of the Glacier part, and so the last lecture of this course. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the future of glaciers um, and in, in the context of uh, global warming, how their melt impacts uh, rising of sea levels. We, we already touched a bit this subject um, during the first lecture, but we are going to dive more into details. So I hope you had fun and you learned new things uh, and I'll see you soon. Bye.